Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and it's time for part two of the Q&A, so let's go ahead and knock this out. All right, first question. What type of program would you recommend for an early intermediate eating maintenance calories looking to maintain gains? Basically, what is the minimum effective volume for this goal? All right, uh, this is the sort of question people ask all the time, and you, you guys really and truly overthink this one. This is one that gets asked frequently. How did you get to the size that you're at? Where did you get your gains? People say, well, you know, I use this progression, this program. It's like, okay, what exact part of the program got you to where you want to be? You, you reached, let's say, the size you want your chest and triceps to be when you got to 250 pounds on the bench press for five sets of five, right? Well, if that is what you used to build those gains, why don't you use the exact same thing to keep them? In other words, you could change stuff. Sure, you could try to find the minimum effective volume. It's probably slightly lower than what you use to build the muscle. In other words, maintaining what you have probably takes a hair less work than what you put in to build it, right? But how much less? I don't know. You're going to risk losing gains if you drop it too much. So I'm going to say that if, if you effectively got your chest to the size you want it to be by bench pressing 250 for five sets of five twice a week, right? I'm going to recommend that you bench press 250 for five by five twice a week to maintain it. Now, you could probably go a hair less. Could, could you maybe do four sets of five? Probably. Could you drop it down to 240 or 245 for five by five and maintain it? Probably. But you probably would ideally need to do something similar to what you use to build the muscle. If you say, okay, I'm happy with where I'm at. I don't want any more gains. I want to eat maintenance calories and stay here. I want to stay exactly where I am. Well, do exactly what you did to get there, right? Do exactly what you did to get there and stop progressing. Don't add reps. Don't add weight to the bar. Don't increase the volume. And you'll be fine. You'll stay right where you were. This is really simple. All right, next question. Hi there, Jason. Uh, my 5x5 five five starting Monday, I want to get my deadlift from 150 kilograms up to 250 kilograms this year. In other words, guys, he wants to put 220 pounds on his deadlift in one year. I was wondering whether I can get away with 5x5 five five on the deadlift three days a week or whether I should stick to a 1x5 or a parts novice program has five sets of deaths, but everyone seems to recommend against it. I get nine and a half hours to 10 hours of sleep every night. I will be eating at a caloric excess of high carb, low fat. All right, all right, brother. You're not going to go from a one. If you've been lifting already for like six months or more, and you're at 150 kilogram deadlift, you're not going to get to 250 in a year. All right, that, that is not going to happen. Now, you might do it in a year and a half. You might do it in two years. You might do it in three years. Uh, all right, your lifestyle. You're eating a surplus. You're getting enormous amounts of sleep, and you want to focus on the deadlift. Well, you need to build muscle mass and you need to build neural efficiency. 5x5 five five is not going to give you a max deadlift. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, that's just the reality of it. That's a lot of volume on deadlifting. It's great for building all the muscles of the deadlift. It's not going to teach you to get really good at maxes in the long term. So what I'm going to recommend, if you want like 5x5, five five, okay, that's fine. And you want to deadlift three days a week, make your 5x5 five five your basic hypertrophy day. Okay, that's really what you want to do, and you want to run a deadlift specialized program. Let's say Monday you could do five by five. You do them on a deficit, right? You want to build muscle. Deficit deadlifts are slightly easier to recover from, hair easier. They have slightly better, in some cases, better hypertrophic potential. Do one to two inch deficit deadlifts for your five by five on Monday. Wednesday, you need to go to your normal conventional deadlift, build to a peak set of five, right? So you're still getting, you're training a combination of volume and neural efficiency. And then, and, and again, when I say that I want it to be RPE nine, I don't want you to have to scream and grind out the fifth rep. A nice heavy five rep set with general progression going up. And then maybe Friday, come in and build to a heavy triple. All right, RPE nine to a nice heavy triple something like that or or even better you could do the five by five monday build to a triple on wednesday and then build to a single on friday in fact i might recommend for a few months you do the five and then the three 
And then as you get a little more progressed, you need to get better at lifting heavy weights. So maybe your Wednesday you come in and you do a heavy triple and then Friday you start doing a heavy single. Uh, something like that is going to get you to your goal quicker if you want to specialize in the deadlift. Uh, but that's probably how I'd run it. You're going to have a slight exercise variation with a slight volume and intensity variation through the week for your three days. All right, next question. Recently, I hurt my shoulder doing standing overhead press. Should I just do seated? Also, I was doing your ice cream fitness program for beginners, but was doing bench and overhead press at each workout as opposed to rotating them. Could this have been a factor in my injury? Yeah, your, your, your injury factors are twofold. Number one, I have them like that for a reason. If you're gonna do five set, five by five bench press and five by five standing press three times a week, uh, yeah, that's a lot of load on your shoulders. You are going to set yourself up for a higher injury rate, but especially because you're a novice, you're going to be fatigued and your form's not going to be perfect. That's a factor. Number two, uh, you didn't do the standing press correctly. You may have even injured your shoulder on the bench press and then it came out when you were overhead pressing. Uh, correctly performed overhead press, the way you see me do my overhead press right now, should not cause shoulder impingement, right? I can tell you what has a higher risk of shoulder impingement, doing them seated. You're more likely to get hurt doing a seated overhead press than you are a standing if you're concerned with shoulder injury. You're going to exacerbate it. Uh, so no, no, I'm going to say probably what I'm going to recommend for someone who has an injured shoulder uh, as a regular poster here who's been a 500 pound bencher when he was much, much younger. He's my age now. He has beat up shoulders from it. He does landmine presses. He can't overhead press at all. He does landmine presses. You can look that up. Uh, that's what he does. Now, I don't do those myself. I'm not necessarily a fan of them, but I've seen several guys, including another older guy at a gym I trained at, as well as this individual who swear by them as guys who have previous shoulder impingement issues. So you might want to give that a go. It might be worth your while, uh, but you need to get that looked at and you need to figure out exactly what caused it. Uh, because those lifts, if done correctly, are not inherently dangerous to your shoulders. Although, again, you probably pushed too hard, didn't follow the program, got hurt. It happens. Uh, lesson learned, right? All right, next question. All right, really similar question. Hey, Jason, my training consists mostly of heavy compounds and weighted body weight exercises, such as bench press, deadlifts, weighted chins, and dips. However, I'm not per able to perform any variation of an overhead breast due to an injury to my left rotator cuff that my doctor told me I might not ever fully recover from. What exercises would you recommend for me to still develop my shoulder girdle as effectively as I can? Thanks. Uh, go back and listen to the last video. Similar issues have been described by other people. I've known of at least two guys who use the landmine press for this. It might be worth considering. And I hate to say that because I don't like it. I consider it a fluffy, wuffy exercise. But, you know, I know multiple guys who've had shoulder injuries, older guys who swear by it. And it doesn't seem to exacerbate their impinged shoulder. So try it. Start light. Start light. Be careful and see how it goes for you. Uh, it's worth at least giving a try. All right, next question and last question of the week. Hey Jason, been a long time subscriber of yours. I have a question. When doing rows, I am really strong at the range of motion up till my elbows are at the same plane as my body. But when my elbows get behind my back, I'm considerably weaker. Tried to fix it using weights. I can go full range of motion. But then my big back muscles are not challenged by it one bit. What do you suggest I do? I realize I've always be weaker when my elbows go past behind my back. But there are a way to close the gap a bit. Thanks. All right. This is kind of what I tell people. Stop believing in the mind-muscle connection for determining what muscles are being worked. <laughs> this is bodybuilding nonsense. You're, you're doing an exercise in which the latissimus dorsi is the primary mover with tons of trap, bicep, everything else involved. Your back is being worked on a row. And if you have to go lighter to do full range of motion, your back is still being challenged. Just because you don't feel that same cramp or stretch or burn you do with the heavier weight on a partial has no bearing on reality as far as what's actually happening. You can't remove your lats from a row. You can't remove your biceps from a row or a chin up. It can't be done no matter where you think you feel it. This is basic biomechanics. Forget all that. What you need to do, work on explosiveness, right? If you can get the weight started, you can follow through. If you can move it fast enough and explosively, you can pull through at the top. Uh, Use a weight that you can lift explosively for your rows so that you can reach your chest with good bar speed from the bottom. 
And it comes back to that point about explosiveness. We know that lifting a weight with good form as explosively as possible causes the most muscle fiber recruitment in all the muscles. That will mean your biceps, your traps, your lats, your rear delts will all get the most stimulation possible. Do the full range of motion ex as explosively as you can with the heaviest weight you can handle explosively for the full range of motion and progress from there. That will sort your problem out. And seriously, on these big compound movements, you really have to stop worrying about where you feel it. Well, I use the lighter weight to do the full range of motion. I don't feel it as much here. That, that doesn't matter. That's just what your brain registers as far as sensation. That doesn't mean that's what's actually happening inside the muscle, right? That doesn't mean that's what's happening. You cannot remove the bicep, the rear delts, the lats, the traps from a row that you are doing through a full range of motion. And if the weight was so heavy, you couldn't pull it through the full range of motion to the weakest point for your lats, your lats weren't getting fully worked, right? They, they weren't maximizing their potential to begin with. So you got to look at it from that perspective. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative and I will talk to you guys next time.